What's cracking, everybody? And welcome to episode 164 of the Good Cracking Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Janelle Pearson, alongside the man, the myth, the legend. Don't feed him past midnight, ladies and gentlemen. We have DJ Guzmo. <laughs> What's happening, DJ? How you doing, baby? Uh, I'm still recovering from last night. Uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, Checks out. But, but I was watching uh, the VOD, and man, that was funny. It was hilarious seeing you guys' reactions, and um, I can't wait to to do something like this again, dude. This would be this would be it's, really cool. It's gonna it's be really a lot cool of fun. Experience. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Genesaw, just to just to fill you in, last night we had uh, for our Splash Game of Scream, uh, we did a thing where DJ played Resident Evil Seven uh, Biohazard for the very first time, uh, and me, Garrick, and Devin commentated over his gameplay. Uh, but he had oh, us yeah. he had us muted in his ear so he couldn't hear what we were saying. So yeah, we were so like, I was up. alone, but they get to laugh, and I yep. I can see yep. them a corner of my eye on my second screen them laughing at me as i get scared <laughs> oh so good dude it's so fucking good man it's it's it was a good piece of fucking content dude i'm like we will be talking about about it again here very briefly but before we do i'd like us to move over to frankenstein's bride herself we have genesa <laughs> gabrielle how you doing so I, I give i give us all halloween names for for this month so oh mm-hmm. i love it mm-hmm. yeah, yeah Devin didn't give me one though because he's a fucking trick but you know that's fine that's fine it's fine you know what i'm saying but we have we have uh we have garrick who's the invisible man uh uh okay. xander is mr tie me up uh <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> dj is dj gizmo because uh during the, <laughs> during the episode where <laughs> where we were discussing what horror icons we were <laughs> our chat voted that he was uh gizmo from gremlins I love it. I love it. Oh, it's fucking good. I hate like, it. <laughs> Devin's the five slash man. Uh, <laughs> he is, you okay. know, five slide man. Five yeah, slash yeah, yeah. Man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, then... So, yeah, Frankenstein's bride. And that's, then that's what Frankenstein's bride. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then, and you don't have a name. Yeah, Devin didn't yeah, give me one. He didn't give me no, one. Yeah, I guess no he's the man with no name. Not worthy of no that's name. That's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. I mean, I didn't, I didn't okay. know that that was, that was, uh, a thing to tell you the truth wow, wow. no we Very discussed observant. it because and i was like he he doesn't want to give himself a nickname because that would get the go i probably yeah, wasn't allowed, a part of that right. conversation I'm not, I'm not allowed to you know, okay so. so dj you and i have to make him a name because this is unacceptable yeah. well now, so, now that i know that this is a thing i'm thinking about it no now. Devin, you lost your opportunity you lost, i you wasn't even chance. told you about this chance. you, lost you can't have a conversation so, without me and then expect me to know about it we can. I thought you were you're there. I'm pretty sure you were you're there a ghost today. Sure? Listen, I'm pretty. I'm pretty so, sure I did explain it. We were discussing your nickname. We like, like, yeah, your nickname we, I, I brought it up to you because you were like okay. five slash man. And I was like, yeah, dude, because Halloween. So are now. Uh, Is that or you have like really shrine. bad internet problems that day? Mm. Mm. Halloween things. What are Halloween things? Mm. Um, <laughs> He's a crack addict, mm. as in ass crack addict. <laughs> <laughs> ass. Okay, I could love a play on words with ass. Um, Nightmare on Ernell Street. Yeah, that works. That's a good one. Oh, no, no, go. no. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. No, no. no, that's, <laughs> no. I, that's, I love. I love that. I don't. I'm not worthy of that credit, but thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I like the. I like the idea of ass. You've really compelled me. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. I thought about mm. that too. Mm. Mm. That's fair. That's the compelling fair. nature of ass. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> the compelling nature of ass. Wow. Okay. So, <laughs> I like the God, idea what of are ass. Halloween things. Um. Okay, so there's like we have like the classic horror. Mm. He's a crack monster. Very. But just an ass crack cra- monster. <laughs> See, this is why I took responsibility giving everybody else names. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Look, you put me on the spot. We got this. Para, the the paranormal activity. You know, instead of, instead of leather, instead of leather face, Aaron, no, no. Ernie face. <laughs> What'd you say, Devin? What'd you say, Devin? <laughs> I said, instead of leather face, we can call you Ernie face. Please don't. Please don't um... do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wait, sorry. <laughs> the Saints, the scariest thing is candy corn. <laughs> It's true. Candy corn. Mm-hmm. Candy corn candy sucks. Corn. The candy yeah. Put that out there right now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I love candy corn. Candy corn's too little polarizing. Little candy pumpkins. Yeah, and Arnold's not polarizing. He's well liked. 
Yeah, he's more like Am a... I... <laughs> he's adorable. I mean... Yeah, you are. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> We're really doing this on our last piece of content for Cracktoberfest. I'm fucking cracking yeah. up. It's we like, are. It took yeah, us yes. to get it, guys. Because I haven't he's been here to defend because you. He's a crack monster. <laughs> Jesus you Christ. Stop... <laughs> Will you stop dying on the No, why am I, why am I a crack monster here? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, <laughs> today we're not talking about crack because today we're talking Scarlet Witch again. The Callista Protocol is too gross, why James Bond actually sucks, and much, much more. Because this is a good cracking podcast. Your choice for all the nerdy video game and pop media news, reviews, and discussions that you want to hear live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. and Saturdays at 12 p.m. If you're on this wave you can head on over to our discord channel where you can submit questions and topics to the show get exclusive content and soon have early access to episodes before they go live on podcasts and video services across the digital sea Yard. Yard. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> but if you've emptied your pockets for the latest and greatest in entertainment, that is totally fine. You can watch us record the show live right here at twitch.tv slash good cracking show. If you have Amazon Prime, you also have Twitch Prime. We would love for you to give that to us to help keep us pushing content out for all of you listening or watching at home. But you can also support us or go by going to our YouTube channel by or by clicking that beautiful bell and big red button or by subscribing to our podcast channel by searching Good Kraken with an exclamation mark and leaving a review there. Thank you. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting, waiting for it to creep up like, in the back of my neck like a hot breath. You know what I'm saying? Genesee! <sighs> we have some captain's orders, okay? So we have, first off, holiday season is now here. And we know y'all are going to be busy. But please, guys, come in. Hang out for the fun. We are still doing content throughout holiday season. Uh, we're going to be taking a... Oh, Genesaw just had a revelation. What? What's, that's revelation <laughs> face if I've ever seen one. What, what just hit you? What was that? Are you okay? <laughs> I was trying to figure out your name. And so I looked up iconic horror villains. And the first one that came up was the Candyman. <laughs> but... <laughs> The candy ass man? Is, that, is that what I'm going to about? The candy <laughs> crack man. The candy ass man. Candy crack man. <laughs> the candy ass man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my face is For the last... For the last... <laughs> for the last... <laughs> Uh, for the last day of the last piece of content for Cracked Overfest, I'll take it. The candy ass man. I'll, that's that's fine. <laughs> uh, Saint Cracks Giving, by the way, for November. Oh, we got some Cracks Giving stuff for y'all. We got some Cracks Giving stuff, uh, which leads perfectly into uh, Crackmas. Uh, which is go the Crackmas. the most wonderful time of the year is uh, Good Crackmas, uh, where we come in, we give you guys uh, lots of fun Crackmas. Christmas conversations. So that's gonna be, we did that last year too. That was gonna be a fun one. Uh, <laughs> Crackmas is probably the second greatest uh, holiday uh, in the entire world behind Christmas, the classic Christmas. Um, Crackmas is just at another level. You know what I'm saying? Anyways, guys, please come in, hang out with us throughout holiday season. We'll still be doing content for you guys. But more importantly, we are getting ready for good Kraken year three. Uh, please share us around. Uh, the biggest way to help support us is by going to uh, spaces like Spotify. Give us spot five stars on Spotify. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts. The more reviews that we get on there, uh, the more the algorithm shares our podcast out to other people. So please go on there. Check that out. We'll be able to never be able to thank you guys enough. Uh, and if you leave a review, we might read it right here for you. Give you guys some attention that we know that you guys love. <laughs> okay. uh, our other captains order, please go check out our very first GK play stream uh, with DJ Simfix playing Resident Evil 7 Biohazard for the first time. Uh, that is up over on YouTube.com slash Good Crack and Show. Uh, and as we were saying earlier, DJ played Resident Evil 7 and me, Devin and Garrick had a fun time trolling the fuck out of him uh with all of you guys at home that was a fucking good piece of content man that that's was such a great the, piece the of jeff content. keely part i'm so glad i came up with that too. did you so did you glad. come up with that, that did you come up with that yeah yeah, yeah I, I i proposed that idea and mm. I, I regret it but i also don't regret it at the same time. <laughs> i regret it i hated every second of it <laughs> yeah. uh saying don't mind that i totally forgot how to spell crack and could have seen it on the screen <laughs> It's okay. We'll, we'll take care of the crack for you. you know what I'm saying we'll take care of the crack for you uh, because I am the candy ass man. Apparently, 
He is the candy ass man. <laughs> DJ, could you tell the people at home what we have going on next? Well, or now mm. we have the helm. Thank you, DJ. <laughs> I like the helm motion they did. Squawk, squawk, yeah. squawk. Yeah, the squawk. the helm motion uh, was was perfectly placed. It's <laughs> very very squawk. perfectly placed. Yeah. Uh, DJ, could you go ahead and uh, actually, you know what? Let's give this one to Genesaw. We haven't heard from Genesaw in a really long time. Genesaw's here. Genesaw's been out for a long while here, um, and I want to get get us a chance to ca get caught up here with Genesaw. But before we do, Genesaw, I'd like you to take our first story, my friend. I would love to because I'm so good at reading the words. Of course um, you are. As we've of course seen you many are. times. This this was an easy one. This uh, is an easy one. So I should know most of these words. Okay, great. Yeah, there you Vision go. Vision Quest is the second WandaVision spinoff, and it could include Wanda's Return by Kat Bailey from IGN. Deadline reports that the new series will be called Vision Quest and that it will potentially feature Elizabeth Olsen as Wanda Maximoff. Some within Marvel are apparently calling it the White Vision Project after the version of Vision that appeared in WandaVision's climactic moments. If Vision Quest comes to fruition, it will join Agatha, Coven of Chaos, as the second series to spring from the success of WandaVision. Both shows will be overseen by Jack Schaefer, who served as WandaVision's creator, writer, and executive producer. WandaVision has provided fertile creative ground for the MCU. As the first of the Disney Plus MCU shows, it gave rise of a popular villain, Agatha Harkness, and it tied directly into Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. That movie left fans with a number of major questions which could be answered in Vision Quest. The writer's room is reportedly set to open next week for Vision Quest, after which we may get some clarity on whether this series actually happens. In the meantime, Marvel Studios is focusing on Secret Invasion, which is set to be released sometime in spring 2023. Lit. Mike, thank you so much for the nice. subscription, dude. We love you, man. We love you, dog. Thank you, Mike. Uh, 19 months is a real long time. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're getting vision back. Uh, that's a very, very interesting decision that they made super, seemingly super fucking last minute. Um, Genesee, I want to ask you. Are you here for as much Wanda Maximoff as we've been getting? Are you here for Scarlet Witch being as prominent as she is? I am. I think that she's a really strong character. Um, I didn't love what they did with her. Well, that's not entirely true. I'm, I'm on. I'm on the fence about how they what they did with her in um, Multiverse of Madness. Okay. Um, I felt like she had just such a strong arc in, um, in her show WandaVision. And there was a bit of a disconnect for me from where we left her and where we found her in WandaVision. Like if that, that they didn't seem like the same character to me entirely. Like I could see how she could get there, but we weren't brought there, you know? Right, um, right. So there there felt like something missing there, but I do I do really love how much we're getting. I feel like she was a very underutilized character um, in the original um, Avengers, and now that they've retired so many of the Avengers, I feel like it really is fitting that she's coming up to the forefront. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, I think that totally makes sense. Uh, Mike in chat says, Wanda in the comics is nuts. She really is. As Magneto's daughter in the comics, like, she kind of starts mm -hmm. to fucking go off a little bit. Uh, DJ, let yeah. me ask you, are are you wanting this follow-up to Vision? Um, yeah, actually. Um, Wanda Vision's kind of, like, my foray into you know my deeper foray into the like marvel cinematic universe like i've watched the movies before and the um uh, like you know in bits and pieces like just collecting whatever like story i can get from the movies i've watched mm -hmm. but wandavision kind of made me like made me want to go back I'm like all right what did i fucking miss because this is like this i need to catch up on everything so you know uh yeah i i want to see a little bit more um I'm I'm kind of on the on the on the same like wavelength with Genesee as in Multiverse of Madness. I was confused as to you know like uh, we didn't we didn't get that bridge from WandaVision to that movie really right right. So like I I was kind of like confused as to you know I was like is she different? Is this a different Wanda that we're looking at? Um, you know what I mean? So like it it just wasn't 
it didn't click as well as I, I, I wish it would have. Yeah, they, they definitely could have given us a little bit more uh, post WandaVision or at least maybe one more episode to give us a backstory to how she gets the Darkhold and like what exactly about it causes her to do the things that happen in Multiverse of Madness because they kind of rely on mm -hmm. us to have had watched uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to kind of really know like what the Darkhold is and why it's important or having had read the comics to understand like what the Darkhold does. Um, <clears throat> and they really so heavily leaned on it that they just didn't even bother to kind of give us like, a bridge between the two. Um, however, I would also say that I, I also kind of want to follow up to Vision. I think that, like white vision or pale vision whatever the hell you want to call them uh flying off at the end of wandavision uh which mm -hmm. spoilers go fucking watch that show if you haven't watched it yet it's been a while uh i think i think that sort of left us in in a note of like well what the fuck happens with them now right <laughs> like like, right. like I, I like and at this point up to now them announcing vision quest uh being a thing um i was kind of like oh so i guess we're just gonna see him pop up in a movie at some point or another i guess like that's mm -hmm. that's probably the game plan that they were gonna go for until you know marvel had to change some things because kevin feige was <laughs> starting to smash his head against fucking wall but uh you know well i guess i guess we'll see from there but i think i think it's good for them to kind of give us a good follow-up to uh to vision what's been going on with him and as far as like this new vision more specifically and the how like does he potentially end up becoming regular vision at some point or another because we didn't really spend a whole lot of time with him in the movies um and i'd like us to get a chance to be able to have this sort of reprieve for Wanda Maximoff as a character, because I feel like she's been going through it for, for a while yeah. now. Uh, it's, been, it's been pretty, pretty fucking heart crushing. Satan chat, good point about the dark whatever it was. Uh, I wish I had known how she got it before Multiverse of Madness. Yeah, it uh, it, it, it comes up because of uh, WandaVision. It, it was Agatha Harkness who had it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's, things it's all out of control there. But there, there's, there's definitely like between the shows and the movies, there's definitely some stuff like going back and forth that like they probably could better explain that they just don't uh that, that's mm -hmm. kind of like the crux of like the tv shows that like they have seemingly left out a lot of stuff that could probably better transition into the movies but you know i guess we can possibly see when the time gets closer dj my man we also have some uh some slightly unfortunate news uh here but mm -hmm. if you could let that people know what our next story is all right, Ernell, the Callisto Protocol cancel in Japan. This comes from uh, Danielle Pardis at GameIndustry.biz. Uh, according to announcement made via the game's Japanese Twitter account, the title was unable to secure an age rating from the Japanese Computer Entertainment Rating Organization. The Callisto Protocol has decided to stop the release of the Japanese version. Uh, as a quote from the, the statement that uh, uh, Eurogamer had verified, uh, as of now, the C, uh, the CERO, C-E-R-O, rating cannot be passed. We have decided that we would no longer be able to provide you with the experience you need. We hope everyone in Japan will understand. If you've already pre-ordered, we will refund you. Uh, according to the Circo Toto of Japanese consultancy firm uh, Canton Games, Sero didn't agree with the amount of violence featured in the space horror title, with developers striking distance reportedly not wanting to cut any content from the game. Last month, Striking Distance CEO Glenn Schofield uh, became the subject of criticism following a tweet that claimed the studio was working six to seven days a week on the Callisto Protocol, often seeing 12 to 15 hour days. Schofield later apologized for the post and said that we value passion and creativity, not long hours. The game is set to launch in the West on December 2nd. So, uh, obviously, it's very disappointing that an entire market is now, like, continental market, technically, mm -hmm. uh, is not going to be able to play this game, unfortunately. Uh, however, I also, I also understand why the developers didn't want to take anything away from the content. Because, I mean, at this point, for the reasons of them being like, oh, the game's too violent, they would have had to completely change the game in order for it to even be playable in japan to that extent uh dj what i want to ask you here is <clears throat> do you think that this was fair for japan like was this a was this a solid move like no matter what this is going to end up having to happen or could they have done something else you think um i think i think so i mean like knowing japan you know like they 
they they like to they like to follow by their rules and their traditions and like you know it's a different culture over there mm-hmm. so we can't expect them to kind of just bend their rules and traditions for uh, a piece of content that may or may not be consumed by you know a niche portion of the population sure so like you know i and, and they they treat i guess they treat like certain violent themes differently over there than what we do here in the states mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um uh and i understand like i say understand both sides because it's like you as a developer you don't really want to change anything about the game that would you know kind of uh kind of weaken like the integrity of the game the structure of the game you know uh you want those themes that you're trying to portray to be as strong as possible to come off to the, the player as strong as possible um and if you have to sacrifice some of those things, and that that means sacrificing that that experience for the your audience that you're creating this for. And as for the board that does the age restriction or the age uh, rating, uh, it makes sense. Like you know, if you can't, there's if from what they're saying, it's this these certain themes. Like there's certain things. Like they're like, no, we cannot have it at all. Like you yeah, need to take right, that out. Right, right, right. You know, so. Like, yeah, a, like it, a man it, holding well, a, a giant dildo in cyberpunk, I guess, is, is acceptable yeah. in all countries. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, it also, I, I'm also curious because, like, I'm like, if if the if this board was like, no, you can't have this thing, I wonder what that thing is. <laughs> like, <laughs> it does not disclose anywhere in the article what it is. It's just too violent. Like, what does that mean? Like, what are we seeing? In these games. Yeah, I know, right? You know so, I mean? so Genesog, the Callisto Protocol, is supposed to be a sort of spiritual successor, like sister game uh, to the hit game Dead Space. Uh, so you're playing as a man who's surviving out in space in some weird space station thing, and these alien creatures that have taken over dead human bodies are trying to attack you actively while you're, you know, trying to navigate your way through, like, what looks like a space station on, like, the moon or some shit like that. DJ, go ahead. Speaking of Death Space, it is banned in Germany, Japan, and China. Death Space? Yes. The nice. original. Hey, guys. Nice. What's uh, up, Devin? Uh, De- Devin Stanford from the Good Kraken Show. Uh, yes, I, yes, I just, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 ju- I just have a comment more so to make. Okay. I think it's funny that these games are getting banned in Japan specifically because a lot of content that comes out of Japan, especially when it comes to, like, animation or movies or anything like that, are... are crazy like body horror dysmorphic types of content anyways like we see it a lot with the movies we see it a lot with tv shows and even like games that come out of there like a lot of like weird content comes out of there and it's interesting that we're seeing games like callisto protocol and dead space get banned there when that is like on par with a lot of the stuff that they do that is a hundred percent fair. Genesaw, do you have anything to say to that as far as uh talking about the context and, and difference in the medium? I mean <sighs> censorship is a really complicated issue. I've I don't know anything about Callisto, so I don't know. It, it's it's released here already, or do, do we not know like it's about to be coming out? Yeah. It's about to in be December. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I'm with DJ in that like I'm really curious to know what is what is the reason that it is being censored because like we say violence and I I hear what you're saying Devin of like oh well we have so many violence in different forms of media that that do come out from Japan but when I heard violence being or well not just violence but violence in terms of censorship there are a few things that I automatically think of that um many countries censor so um homosexuality is censored um now because they mentioned violence it's probably not that but like sexualized violence um sure. so many other sure. like specific forms of violence um could be present in the game that um would make censorship make sense to me i also really understand what you're saying about like um cultural differences and i do think that there's something 
more active about a video game in terms of your participating in something that would make censorship make sense to me. Whereas in anime or other forms of um, media, you're watching it and you're consuming it, but you're not as much an active participant in it. And so I could see for also there are different um, there are different approval committees, right? The people who are approving ratings on video games are not the same people who are approving ratings on movies uh, tv shows so on, vid- so yeah on. movies yeah. and tv shows yeah <laughs> so um just the same with music like you can you can legally say so many things in music that you couldn't say in an interview or um right. other forms of, of media no, so there's, there's um a, a i do think there's a difference music. there <laughs> yeah i i yeah i i i think yeah genesis genesis got it on the nose because like I'm, I'm pretty sure uh with the the Japanese computer entertainment rating organization. I'm pretty sure that they have this that kind of same philosophy or like the uh, philosophies that uh, Genesee was talking about, like how they view violence and stuff like that. It's probably way different than what the, I don't know, whatever board is for like entertainment, like, you know, movies, shows, anime. So um, it, it could also just they, be because you're playing it rather than just watching it. And that just, Yeah, that's like, why I'm saying. Like, maybe that's their philosophy over there. It's like, oh, if you're an active participant, then that means like, uh, you're prone to to succumb to like the violent themes that are being portrayed. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it's it's also like we are viewing it in like a cultural difference. But if we think about the U.S., like our rating systems are wackadoodle too. Like I think about because yeah. I read a lot, right? And so TV has such a strict rating system, but books don't have a rating system so much as they have genres and right. what mm-hmm. genre you publish in um changes what like where you can get published and so many different things and there's like an expect it, books are so weird like books are so weird because there isn't like a strict rating system so the perception of what it's going what genre it's going to be um impacts people's reaction to it so much so we have our own wackadoodle stuff here too very yeah, fair. and it also comes down to marketing too. Like I think, like uh, I was reading like a post just now. It's like uh, it just depends on like it also like marketing goes into account for these like ratings and stuff like that. Because Dead Space mm-hmm. was banned, but it is also banned because or it had a Z rating over there, which is like the eighteen plus rating in Japan. So like they can't market that really, and so like they may may as well just like ban. It's not ban ban, but I guess it's like banned outright because you can't really market it and sell it right with that kind of rating i'm pretty sure yeah um, yeah no Devin, good input man I, I think that was that's a very a very good call to have as far as uh you know wanting to be very interested like the differences in culture when it comes to, to comes to that but i mean like we've seen we've seen things like tokyo ghoul come out of japan which <laughs> is yeah oh yeah that's what i'm saying insane or like um, live action attack on titan yeah yeah, yeah right there's, uh, there's, there's, live action full metal alchemist you know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you I know, think, we, we I, get things like that and not not to mention the, the types of horror movies we get from Japan, too. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. I think I think the yeah, it, it really just comes down to the media. I'm like the having I think that it's just being that you're playing it is probably what makes the biggest difference, because I know that like a lot of countries view it as uh, because it's a hands on experience is a higher chance of you like pertaining to it on a more of a personal level, which is why that conversation about like school shootings being related to games like Grand Theft Auto, quote unquote, 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 um, is such a repeating mm-hmm. conversation that has had. Now, by all means, culturally speaking, we don't necessarily agree with it because for us, we're like so desensitized by this shit. Like I can play a video game of me splitting someone's fucking skull open all day fucking long <laughs> but yeah. in other countries they're not as used to that sort of shit as we probably are so maybe for them it makes more of an impact you know but thank you for bringing that up Devin. i appreciate it um horror, horror anime is graphic as fuck says mike it sure is dude it really really sure is there's some wild shit we see in anime you guys did you guys ever watch this old ass anime movie uh called x Back in like nineteen no. like ninety four or some shit like that, but this it was like a dude like modern day times like a fucking half sword and he's just splitting people's heads in half and shit. I watched that when I was really young and that's probably one of the reasons uh, I got super fucked up. 
<laughs> going up, I'll tell you what. But some, speaking of some stuff that is not fucked up, actually some stuff that is kind of wild, but also not very surprising. Hideo Kojima teases a new game is quote unquote like a new medium. This comes from Tanner Deadman over at comicbook.com. Hideo Kojima is once more talking about a new project he's working on, but as usual, his teases are both cryptic and ambitious. Uh, in recent comments shared in an interview with The Guardian, he talked about what are the projects he's working on and said it's quote unquote almost like a new medium. The new game he talked about was naturally not named, however, so it's still unclear what exactly it is he's taught discussing. Excuse me, that was a weird sentence structure. This game, discussed mm. briefly by Kojima, is one of two projects Kojima Productions is currently working on. Kojima's big big on moves, just as he is on games, with many of his posts from his personal Twitter accounts discussing films he's watched, and in his comments shared with The Guardian, he said this new game, if successful, will impact both the games industry overall as well as the movie industry. Uh, quote, it's almost like a new medium, Kojima said. If this succeeds, it will turn things around not just in the game industry, but in the movie the industry as well, end quote. Those who keep up with Kojima's musings about his games will recall similar comments made about Death Stranding before that game released. During the build-up to its launch, people didn't really know much about the game and still didn't know much after it was actually available. It's understood much better now that it's been out for a while and has had time to come to the PC platform too, but Kojima previously described it as something that would usher in a quote-unquote totally brand new genre. Uh, quote-unquote strand game was the term thrown around back then. Death Stranding 2 has been all but confirmed by now, so perhaps when the game's revealed and released, there actually will be a quote-unquote strand game genre, since two games will exist. But for now, Kojima's most recent discussions about making something that's quote-unquote like a new medium refer to the second project Kojima Productions has in works. Kojima has been sharing additional teases about his games periodically after it was confirmed that Ellie Fanning would star in one of his projects. But for now, we'll have to wait on an official reveal to learn more. So I do want to clarify, too, that it's it seems that his strand game thing that he was talking about, the thing that makes it a strand game was the concept of you playing in a world that. In the game, other people are playing, but things and items and stuff that they leave behind in their game is actively popping up in your game. So in Death Stranding, if you leave like a ladder somewhere or you set up like a box or a post or something like that in the open yeah. world, people in other games on the same server will also see that item that you left there for other people to be able to use. Uh, super interesting mechanic. And like, you know, we see stuff like that happen in a few games, but it's not quite exactly the same thing. Um, DJ, as a gamer here, my friend, um, are you sold around the hype of Hideo Kojima changing the medium of video games and movies together i okay so at this point like look i love kojima as much as the next gamer does right i think he's a genius but um i i didn't play death stranding because you know it it just didn't seem appealing to me but i will get around to it because you know i want to try the first strand game you know i want to be one of the one it's of the lucky game. few <laughs> it's, it's a good game um, yeah um, but, uh, it's, I, I don't know what Kojima's got in this bag right now. Like he's talking like this, this is like that completely new thing, but we've seen a mashup of movies and video games, kind of like a, or, or a more interactive story, right? right? We've seen D Detroit become human. We've seen like these telltale, like walking dead games. Right. So like. I don't know what he's trying to do exactly. <laughs> I wonder if this is like just a playable cutscene that is basically just Metal Gear Solid 4, but a little bit more interactive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I just I just don't know. Like, is, is it is it going to be like a movie? Like, are we just getting like a two hour runtime game, basically? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and then that's that's it um that i can press a few buttons and change the outcome of the story or um or is it more of like a game that could be a movie because it's all <laughs> cinematic and you know there's yeah. the camera the position of the camera is different in different sections like i'm trying to figure out what what, what what's going on in kojima's brain right now because he's on like 
he's on this 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 wavelength that we just we just can't understand what's going on in his brain because yeah, he's yeah. one either an alien two he's like some type of advanced ai three he's just not from here like you know or all just, of the above all the above all the above is, is, is possible because like kajima is he's like a living legend now he's kind of like a myth like you see him and you're like damn like what is that which is which is <laughs> funny to think about too right because like he realistically speaking Kojima hasn't done that very like very many games. He hasn't, he hasn't done, done that many ha- but games, like, dude. Like, but but what he does turns to fucking gold. Like yeah, it's like yeah, it's like whoa whoa whoa. Like like he he drops it in our hands and we're bobbling. Like what the fuck is this? <laughs> and then as soon as we grab onto it, we're like, <gasps> yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. It's it's like he, you know it's it's. He just he just like we're not worthy. We're not worthy. (laughs) Such a brain for like writing and directing that is just so out there. I want him to direct the movie. When is he gonna direct the movie? Maybe maybe this is his entryway to it. Maybe this is where he's trying to he 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 got he got Guillermo del Toro, Mads Mikkelsen, fucking Norman uh, Reedus, yeah, Leah Sado. Norman Reedus in a game. In a they he asked them, hey. Would you want to be a part of this game? I feel like he's trying to convince us to play this next game. Like it's like <laughs> everything is a persuasion tactic with this guy. When, re- when really he's just trying to become a director in Hollywood. Like that's like that's yes. all he's trying to do. That's a, that's his way to do it. Just but, let me. But I, at the end of the day, as long as as long as Kojima doesn't get canceled or for anything, I think he's gonna go down as like one of the, like the legends, you know, in in our book. Oh, absolutely, like, he will be absolutely. You know what I mean, I. I I'm, I'm here. I'm here I for the day that comes when he gets an Oscar. It's gonna be great. <laughs> it's gonna be funny. Dude, oh man, I'd I, I'd be crying. <laughs> it's gonna be good, dude. G- Genesis, happiness and what, laughter. What would you need from this video game slash movie in order for <laughs> you to feel like it's going to change the mediums? I really, really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no opinions. Um. Yeah. I don't. I. I obviously I'm I'm not even going to pretend to act like I know shit about video games so I don't even know what it would mean to like change the medium. Um I do think I get uh, I don't know hesitant when creators say that they're going to do something. I would much prefer that they just do the thing and let <laughs> us receive it than then be yeah. like, "Oh my god, I did a thing." You know, yeah, like when sure, Taylor sure. Swift says, oh, this is my favorite thing I've ever written. I'm like, I'm probably not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that's fair. I agree. That's because I agree the true. shit that slaps is the stuff that she does. And then and then we're sitting here like 10 years later, like, oh, my God, the scarf, you know, like if, she didn't even know that was going to slap. And um, yeah. I think that's what does it for me. Like, I also think, I don't know if you guys hear this, but all the time, like in literary circles, people are like, I wonder if, oh God, I don't even know the author's names. The author of The Hunger Games. The, yeah, the oh, what fuck. games? The Hunger Games. The, the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't yeah, know the Hunger Games. Yeah, the part. author of that. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, games um, <laughs> like I wonder if she knew what she, like the grip she had on us with um but what about the baby oh Saint like, says Suzanne Collins okay there we go Suzanne Collins Suzanne thank Collins you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. did you. Suzanne Collins know the grip she had on us when she said but what about the baby she wasn't out here being like oh just wait until this chapter and this line like it's gonna change the whole game for you she just fucking did it and it changed everything and like we're sitting here years later being like but what about the baby <laughs> damn anyway. Ge- genesis is a yeah. confirmed hideo kojima hater can you believe that that's crazy yeah. dude. That's i mean like <laughs> i'm in the same boat, I'm in the same boat as wild <laughs> i'm in the same boat with genesis because like I'm kind of low key tired of Kojima just like tooting his own horn. Like I get it, but like, like we get it. Like we're not worthy. We're sorry that we're in the Why presence of God. Why he does it too? 
Listen, yeah. De- Death Stranding is a good game. It's a, it's a good it's game. Great, it's but, a good game. It's not but a great game. It was not to the level that he was hyping this shit. He was no, like, this was shit's going to be up, like, revolutionary. Then, a strand game was going to be the newest gaming experience. And then he, he, he gets on this high horse afterward <laughs> on social media. It's like, you wouldn't understand. Like, I'm like, what if we not understand? <laughs> <laughs> we played it, Leo. Like, <laughs> we played it, dog. What, like, <laughs> what, I don't. I don't know what a strand game is. I'm so sorry, Hideo. Like, please let me know what a strand game is, and I'll play the game. Give me a free copy of the director's edition. It looks maybe, like maybe me. That will change my mind. It looks like me and Denver are the only Hideo believers around here. You know what I'm saying? Praise be to Kojima. <laughs> Nobody's you know I mean? saying <laughs> that. Praise, no. praise be. Praise be to Kojima. You know what I mean? God damn. All hail the great Kojima. <laughs> be- I also just Jima, think like Jima. Jima. <laughs> i obviously have no investments in kojima one way or another but like i what i hear dj saying is that like you can like someone and really respect them as a creator and then also be like dude just let us figure stuff out for ourselves like let us create our own opinions if you're if you're making something that is good enough to be a new medium that is going to change the industry and let us let us let us decide just like drop the mic on it like you know just let us have it right like Can, just give it to us and we'll be like holy shit it's like a new medium guys it's a new thing <laughs> like then that you know then we could then you can, can say I, that yeah. Can I chime in on something? So as, yeah, as, as as one who has been playing Death Stranding off and on, because that game does, it, it can lose your attention pretty fast just due to the nature of like how much you have to. It's an it's an open world grind. walking game with horror elements. That's basically what it is. Like it's like you do a lot of walking yeah. in this game. <laughs> I I I do want to emphasize that cinematically that game is kind of a masterpiece in a sense, especially compared to most video games. Uh, the writing is actually pretty decent when it comes to some of the characters and stuff. There are some kind of eh things, but it's I and I've said this before. It's one of the most beautiful looking games I've played. It, it is a very it, it looks great ass game, dog. I mean, like you have uh, Bridges, uh, who is crossing bridges to deliver his mail via the bridge network. Uh, while making like, bridges. While making bridges in between and the Conan worlds. And Conan O'Brien yeah. makes a cameo appearance in the game. He sure does. Yeah. He, I, he can run into his character. He gives you a hat. Yeah, it gives you a cool, like, little... Little fur hat. Little hat thing. Yeah, it's dope. Yeah, a little it's dope. fur hat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why he was in the game, but he's in it. And, and, and <laughs> you see none of, none of the characters um, via... You, you talk to most of the characters via hologram. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, it's very very disconnected it's like a it's like a message to our society to today you okay. know, we have to bridge All the right. gap well, via social media yeah, sure. and okay. electronics yeah right hideo kojima is that what is that what a strand game is right are we are we getting to that this this post post realism surrealism uh you know thing society thing well, one Kojima? day, one day we will find out what Kojima means by <laughs> strand game. But before we do, and before we move on to our next segment, uh, I want to remind everyone that they can support us over on our Discord channel where they can get early access to episodes before they go public. They can write on the show and they can get episodes ad free here pretty soon. But if they're hearing this, they probably aren't on a Discord channel. So for now, have a word from our sponsors. This piece of good Kraken content is brought to you by Glide Mousepads. The world is changing and the demand for PC gaming and work from home setups has never been as wild as it is right now. Having the best of the best in PC accessories only makes it easier to get your work done before you jump right back into the fray of the digital sea. And Glide knows exactly how to make that happen for you. Glide Mousepads is the future industry leader in mousepads offering beautiful, smooth, waterproof products made with eco-friendly materials and non-slip rubber in a variety of sizes that are guaranteed to help you get that next win. Now, if you're like me and you spend a lot of time in your command center, whether it's streaming, editing, or designing, you need a quality mouse pad that can keep up with that constant grind. You can go to GlideMousePads.com right now and use code Kraken for 15% off the Founders Edition mouse pad in every size available. Again, that's code K-R-A-K-E-N, Kraken, for 15% off any Founders Edition mouse pad today. 
Our next sponsor is Rogue Energy. Late nights are pretty much commonplace for us content creators and any of us here at GK can attest that sometimes you're just too damn tired to even think about how not to be tired any longer. Lucky for us though, Rogue has figured out how to give those late nights and even earlier mornings the supercharge that we all need. Rogue Energy is a low calorie, no sugar energy formula that is the perfect alternative to sugar filled canned energy drinks and sodas. Every formula Rogue Energy produces is designed with optimal levels of high quality ingredients and no chalky textures. Being the only gaming drink company in the world with four unique product lines to suit your task at hand, Rogue Energy strives to improve the in-game performance of gamers, streamers, and content creators around the globe. Check it, we have been drinking the ever-living crap out of this stuff. If I'll be completely honest with you, me, Devin, Garrick, Xander, Raven, Genesee, all of us here at GK absolutely adore this drink. Uh, it helps us in the mornings, helps us in the evenings. Uh, you guys know how it is. We've been going on about this forever and it is no exception now. It's still taking care of us to this day. You can head on over to rogueenergy.com and use code GKRAKEN for 10% off your purchase of any shaker or formula tub of your choosing. That's G-K-R-A-K-E-N for 10% off any shaker or formula tub that you'd like. Now, back to the show. <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, we can't talk we, about that. It was a very interesting okay. conversation during our ad break. That was a fucking good time. <laughs> I mean, how does Hideo Kojima and Kanye West get along? Uh, that's... <laughs> What a great conversation. Anyways, Genesee, what do we have next for the people at home? Oh, goodness. Next, we have Hands on Deck. Thank you for giving me a regular segue and not the shit that <laughs> Devin and, 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 and DJ have been doing. Like, you I'm see boring. these? Hands on Deck. <laughs> see <laughs> fucking killing me, dude. Killing me. <laughs> well, guys, we have another wonderful Hands on Deck segment. This is our Hands on segment. We talk about some games or movies or shows that some of us have been playing or watching or experiencing uh, since our last episode. We pitch it to each other. We try to pitch it to you guys at home to let you know if it is worth experiencing Experiencing yourself, or if it's dog shit, as average Larry would say, let's fucking go. Dog now, shit. we have a very uh, special thing here with DJ. DJ this week has been playing uh, a very fun title here that has recently come out. He's been playing. I don't think you should say that. Saints Row. <laughs> DJ, talk about it, my king. How has Saints Row been? All right. So um, I'll have to preface this review. Of the newest Saints Row game, the newest Saints Row, yes. the rebrand, the the reboot of the Saints Row franchise. Uh, I got it for free with the purchase of my graphics card. Um, I got an AMD card, so they gave me like this free three game pass thing. Um, and I got Saints Row for free. Um, now I I've I've read the online discourse of the game mm -hmm. and how garbage it is uh, for a sixty dollar title. This, this is this game releases sixty dollars, but I got it for yes. free, and sure. I was wondering, the the preface of the review, I was wondering if the if me getting it for free, maybe you know, uh, would better my experience. You know, if I don't, if I came in with zero expectations, and you know, since I got it for free, I'm like, what do I have to lose? Uh, so I can give you guys a review to see if you guys should get this, if it's on discount, or if you had a chance to get it for free, that you should pick it up. So, um. Don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I spent, All right, and I now we'll move to first... our headlining segment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I have to. I have to say, I was, I was secretly hoping that maybe I would find like a hidden gem. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe the people were over exaggerating when this first the game first released. Maybe it was, you know, maybe it just needed a different lens. You know, maybe I need to look at this through a different lens, but. Um, I just see this. I experience the same thing everyone else experienced. It it feels uninspired. It feels it's just boring. There's, it's not unique. You know that's what Saints Row was was like. But you know to separate it from Grand Theft Auto, and the other kind of like these open world experiences that came out during that time was the 
the leaning into and doubling down into the outrageousness, the over the top spectacles that you see in these games. Like I want to fucking fly off a fucking building and crash into another one. You know what I mean? Like I want to drive my car, flip it over, hit the booster pack and jump out and then smack someone with a dildo if I really wanted to, right? Cause it was possible. <laughs> yeah. Saints Row 3, you're like, fuck yeah. Like let's keep on going, you know? But this game feels like it should have been, it should have came out in that time. This feels like a Saints Row 3 like DLC, you know? Mm, oh, wow. And oh, even wow. then, okay. It's a shitty DLC because <laughs> oh no, all I, right. Like Saints Row used to be about fucking gangs and you know committing crimes and shit in the most outrageous way possible with really witty and and funny story writing and charismatic characters that you remember. I don't even remember what uh the the crew your crew in this game is. I don't even remember their names. I don't even know what they look like. And I and I spent mm. the first two hours looking at them and talking to them. And then as soon as you finish the prologue, basically, the, the, the tutorial area, they throw you into the open world. And you're like, hey, you have your main missions and your side missions. And some uh, things that you can access on your phone where you get to collect bounties and kill people. Um, well, let, let's actually let's, just, ba let's back up for a second. What is the story in this game? So um, it starts off uh, this character that you'll see throughout. Um, going into this like mansion that apparently you own you're having a party and uh, I think they're there to collect a debt and then somehow you get knocked out your character gets knocked out after you, you get to create your character which was kind of uh, the character creation was there yeah sure, um, sure and so and then you see like the the rest of the Saints Row games like you see your character talk and move you get to choose their voice and stuff like that and interacting with other characters and cutscenes. And so you get knocked out, and then, like, uh, it seemed like this was, like, in the future, and then we're blasting back to the past where you, you're working for this um, mercenary group, this private military organization called, uh, fuck, hell, uh, Marshall. For, okay. For Marshall. Okay. And, you know, and you're going through this, this, this tutorial, like, you're a rookie, you're going to this, into the squad, and you get attacked into this fucking wild west set looking piece um against like wild western looking enemies like they have bandanas and red shirts and like, <laughs> okay. banditos all right <laughs> and and you and then there's a turret section and it's just it's it's not even like it doesn't make sense it's nonsensical but it doesn't it's not even funny it's not even like it doesn't hit at all i'm just like confused and then after that you're still working with them. It's like you're still working with Marshall as like a part timer. You're a part time job mercenary, as long as. And then you you share apartment with your three roommates who are your your buddies, your best friends, and they're all like. Like I know I'm a I'm a zoomer, but this is like this is like what <laughs> I I I think in the boardroom of like fucking millennials and boomers that they that they're like oh this is what we 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 should have this type of character for these Gen Zers mm. right they'll, they'll they'll relate to this for sure and and that's what those three characters are like they're just different like archetypes of these like what people perceive as like these gen z motherfuckers like the, these roommates they like, all have this like collective bond it's like it's filmed like a sitcom it's it's and like there's like these one-liners these like these jokes that like seem like inside jokes it, but there's just no laugh track like this 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 game is all over the place i don't even know what the fuck this is <laughs> so let me so let me ask you then was there was there any was there any breath of fresh air in this game at all? Because it sounds like you're pretty like, this is just no, another fucking Saints Row game. Was there anything to this that was a shining light at the end of the maybe tunnel? Maybe the, I, I would have to say, probably like the setting, but like, it's like you're in, I think you're in somewhere like near Mexico or some shit. Or like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe New Mexico or Albuquerque. <laughs> okay. Like, okay. it's like, you know, it's, it's new for the Saints Row franchise. It's new, but you get old of it really quick because you can't go into any of the buildings besides like the shops, and it doesn't feel lived in. It just looks like it's just 
everything is just it feels like a game like i feel like i'm playing a like a mobile game or a game on like the ps2 it's like it's not lived in oh. it feels desolate oh, no it doesn't it, there's no <laughs> redeeming qualities there's no personality it looks like that's why i couldn't pinpoint where the fuck this place is i just named a bunch of shit that just reminds me of it like <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> <laughs> Genesee, Genesee, do you have any questions for DJ about Saints Row? What do you want to know about Saints Row? Oh, I lost go. my buttons again. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I like clicked on like five things, and I have like five different windows open that are not you. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I. I don't have questions, but I really do. I love what you're saying. I I talk a lot about like whenever we're reviewing anything or when I'm ingesting any form of media about like who's making this and why. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And I really love what you're saying and that they're like trying to make it for a certain audience without talking to that audience. That's mm -hmm. how I felt watching She-Hulk. Um, yeah. Damn. I was like. <laughs> Who are you making this for? Damn, damn. <laughs> because it's not me. And I love, like, I, in a past life, wanted to be a fucking lawyer. Like, this should be my show. And it's not. So, like, I hearing that from you, like, speaks volumes to me. And I think that mm. that's, um, I don't know, really interesting. Yeah. And, Man. I and do, I, I am curious. Mm -hmm. I am curious because you said that if you had to pay for this game... You wouldn't pay for it. If you I could get it again free, knowing what you yeah. know now, would you play I, it? No, because <laughs> I I honestly I I felt so drained. I've never been drained from a video game. I've never felt so exhausted. Like e even even turning um, my brain off to just play the game was a challenge. Mm -hmm. Because it just it just wasn't fun. It just felt like go here, do this because like, because I've played enough games. I played enough good games to know what is good. And what I find is just fucking dog shit. And this is just a load of dog shit. Like I'm moving here. I'm stealing a car going here. Like each side mission is the same. I played three side missions. All of them came out the same. You go somewhere, you talk to an NPC. They, they, they poof out of thin air and then they poof back out and then you run to a next waypoint that's marked on your map and then you have to kill a, 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 a number n amount of en uh, enemies until the, the mini boss comes out and you kill the mini boss and then side missions over <laughs> i did that three times three times before i was like is this not the same mission i <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah okay okay yeah and so uh i i this 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 is this was this was pain i went like i i i watched another person's review after i played the game and uh this is this comes from uh the black okage on youtube and he said i, I wouldn't even wish this on my worst enemy <laughs> like i wouldn't even give this that game my worst enemy rad I fucking love that guy. He's a, he's a, he's a that's, cool dude. That's a good rating. That's um, a good review right there. <laughs> so I, I have to give this like a, a rating. Yep. This is a 2 out of 10, man. Don't pick this up oh, ever. Oh, wow. If you have the opportunity, oh, wow. this is the lowest rating I've ever given any piece of content on GK. Is a 2 out of 10. Is that the lowest piece of GK content? I'm pretty sure that's the lowest rating a GK review has ever been. Holy shit. I think coming into, that, the, was coming like into this show... Coming into the show, I was thinking about four, but as soon as I started listing off the things and I realized how much like, oh not God, fun it's I worse. had with the game, <laughs> I got worse. <laughs> right it down. Like, it's not even redeemable. Uh, the Saint Row should just sh get shelved. Never touch it again. Um, move on to different things. Damn, they tried, man. They really, they really, really tried, unfortunately. Well, thank you, DJ, for your review. And there you go, guys. That is a 2 out of 10 official GK rating of Saints Row. Uh, don't play it. <clears throat> Don't play it. It does Don't not sound it. like this is a playable game. So. <laughs> no. uh, Mike Fuck says, no. wait, where do the two points come from? The two points? Um, it's not even fun to just dick around in. Yeah, but what what were what, what were the Saints, redeeming qualities that gave it two points? Oh, what well, the two points? Um, 
I got it for free. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> That's what one point. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> two. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wait. I have to think because like it. I can't just say like what I'm gonna say and and it'll just stick. I have to like explain. This. So like two. The the second point is, um, you know, it's definitely something that's like you'll know that you can just turn your brain off like if you want to sit through like if you have nothing else to do i guess you could boot this up and be like yeah i can just shoot at whatever blow something up you know what i mean okay if you had it for free if you had it for free i'm saying if you had it for free you'd be like i could download this game boot it up play it for like 20 minutes and then like turn it off <laughs> Mind, it's <laughs> mindless it. fun i got you. okay yeah mindless okay. fun you can have some mindless fun with it i just couldn't because i was just so offended um <laughs> that even i got this for free i just couldn't have fun so uh i <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's a two out of all ten. right all right i like it i like it i like it guys let's move into our headlining segment here uh the mm-hmm. good old uh, classic headlining segment my friends protect your motherfucking neck because we're going to the gala <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you dj for the neck example there guys today for our headlining segment we are talking for our final cracktoberfest piece of content here the female gaze in horror all right so just to let everybody know and give everybody a quick little um history thing here so the male gaze uh was a uh a film film analyst phrase that was created by a film analyst named Laura Musquet, I think that's what her name was, or something like that. Um, And she Mm -hmm. talked about the male gaze being a thing in movies in which male writers and directors write stories and create movies from the perspective solely of men. Um, (laughs) No, Mike, not gays like gays. (laughs) Gaze as in like a gaze. <laughs> like you're gazing at no something. Gaze. <laughs> Every time you say that, I think about that too. Not a lie. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. The female gaze in horror. <laughs> you all, y'all are fucking killing me. No, so the male gaze. Uh, gaze like gazing at something uh is the perspective Gazy. of of males writing something and being able to only sort of interpret the things that they're writing from a perspective of being a man um so some examples of that are uh james bond is notorious for only having women in their stories to be used as a plot device or a support system for the male character to get what they want at the end of the day in the plot, right? So that is a mm-hmm. perfect example of male gaze. Uh, we see things like uh, Harley Quinn in uh, Suicide Squad is uh, uh, basically this dolled up little thing with pigtails and a short skirt, and she's just there to look pretty, and that's kind of it. Whereas in uh, uh, Birds of Prey and The Suicide Squad, uh, Harley Quinn is a much better example of the female gaze in the sense that she's there for empowerment for her character. Um, she has her own agenda, her own things that she's worried about. And she's not there to just be a sex icon, right? Um, so Genesaw brought this conversation to the table some weeks back and said, I think this will be a really fun thing for us to talk about for horror content. And I want to precurse this by saying horror is a very interesting genre for us to be talking about for this perspective of this because yeah having female gaze and horror is such a 50 50 thing in in horror genre right like there's some movies that nail it for the female gaze uh like we've 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 seen movies that like alien that is, is just 100 about a woman who is just there and she just so happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and that's that like she's not there to to be some you know thing for men to fucking look at she's definitely not there as a support character she's like the character and it has nothing to do with her being a woman and everything to do with her being a character character right uh so with that said genesis i want to move over on to you here talk a little bit about why you wanted to bring this up as a conversation and what are some of your favorite examples for the people at home to better understand what the female gaze is in horror movies specifically yeah so um i'd say i first got into the idea of horror from the female gaze like really thinking about that as a concept um 
many months ago when I picked up this book that was actually about um, written horror. And um, it was about the classic written horror, Frankenstein, it has a bunch of other examples. Um, but it, oh God, I forget what the title of it is. And it's somewhere packed up in all of our shit while we're moving. But um, female gaze. <laughs> it's like about the women who, the women who created the horror genre. Mm -hmm. right okay. so not just saying like oh yeah influential like f female writers in horror but like when you look at classic horror frankenstein being one of the absolute pinnacles of not just written horror but when it was translated into film um was written and created and idealized by a woman and we often don't think about that and i think like in film horror when we think of the classic horror films the, a lot of them are made from the male gaze right right, right. and um center the male gaze even when they have prominent female characters um and final girls final girls is a really strong theme and like it's essential to many successful horror films um but the intent with which those final girls are written and to which their stories are achieved um often don't come from their own power and their own stories and their own um fruition it comes from some outside thing that we can identify as the viewer as the, a symptom of the male gaze right right, right. Mm -hmm. Now, also want, um, wanted to be very then, clear, too, if I may, um, that yeah. we're not necessarily saying that, like, someone has to be a female in order for them to write things from a female gaze. This is a perspective of mm -hmm. of perspective of the content you're writing and who it pertains yeah. to and how those characters in your writing are represented, right? Yeah. And um, I do think it is important, and we talk about this a lot in terms of representation of like, and DJ, we were just talking about it of like, when you are writing stories for a perspective other than your own, who are you create? Who are you including in that creation, and how are you making that story? Because I think if, um, as a woman, if a man is creating a female story just on their own of what they think women are gonna like, they You're usually like... hit them. They they miss the mark. Yeah, um typically. it's just how it is but, <laughs> yeah. and not just this isn't just a female male thing this i mean like white creators do it all the time with yeah, for poc content right yeah mm -hmm. um so i think that that's something in terms of content creation that is shifting is we're not just wanting to see those stories but we're wanting to see we're wanting to feel those stories and have those stories be something genuine and not just um something that's there to have it you know, yeah. um, we're being a lot more critical with the um, media that we're consuming and um, how they're created is becoming a lot more important. And so re more recently, we've and especially like we're we're in the height of horror releases, right? We're in October. Yeah. We yeah. had right. many horror releases this year. And I was thinking about some of the different things that have come out. I'm not a big horror fan. I'm a huge scaredy cat. So I don't, I, it's hard for me to get into horror. Um, but there have been quite a few things this year that I've watched and I have, and I haven't liked. Sorry, my dog is like losing her shit. She's like, <laughs> mom, 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 <laughs> mom, mom. <laughs> Mom, <laughs> mommy, mom. <laughs> literally, literally, like, right around my feet. Like, mom. Um, she was hanging out with grandma all morning, and I made the mistake of thinking that she'd be content all yeah, day sure. with grandma. She's sure, like, no, I want sure. my mom. <laughs> um, so we we did a review. I think I was here for the review of the most recent Scream, Scream 5. Yep, that was you and I. Mm. <laughs> that was us and that was something that i thought was so interesting because you could tell i i felt like they were trying to make it from the female grace right yes. and they did change a lot they had so many like people of color so, such a strong female cast are we allowed to spoil it now at this point um I, I would try to still avoid spoilers if we can okay. help it so but i won't yeah. spoil it <laughs> But they, they changed a lot of things and they did try to flip a lot of scripts um, in not just that are classic to horror, but are classic to the Scream franchise, right? Um, right they also like be. tried to make, 
Yeah, they tried to make a lot of nods to the Scream franchise, which, as Ernell said in our review, was very poorly executed. Um, yeah, I, I feel like movie, the latest... <laughs> yeah, the latest Scream really, really was trying to do horror from the female gaze in every way that you can do it. And I think that when you're now trying to do horror from the female gaze, something that is important is taking iterations of horror that have happened in the past and flipping them successfully or you know like making those nods but doing it in a way that um empowers women and doesn't just be like oh yeah we're doing this thing you know um and scream failed to do it scream did a terrible terrible job but one of my absolute favorite pieces of content recently and something that really successfully did oh boy. horror from the female oh boy games, here we go it was Pretty Little Liars Original Sin. God and we're all smiling it. because God I think damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ernell, yeah. everybody mark my words. I want everyone in the chat, everyone present, the second that Ernell watches this show in its entirety, he is going to love it. Because it really is something masterful. And I think that it's it feels laughable because it's called Pretty Little Liars Original Sin, and that's a terrible fucking title. Um, it also, it, um, when we think of Pretty Little Liars, we don't think of horror. We think of the original Pretty Little Liars show, right? Which was not a successful iteration of horror, in my opinion. Right. Um, but what Pretty Little Liars Original Sin does is it takes um, the concept, the very, very broad concept from Pretty Little Liars of an A, right? Of this unknown masked person who is blackmailing these teenage girls right um these young women with secrets from their own past right right mm. but what the show does is it takes that broad concept and it brings into a greater question of what like the the main theme of of this season of the show is what happens when the sins of the mother fall upon the daughter? So it's unpacking generational trauma. It's unpacking um, female trauma um, and how we as women contribute um, to each other's um, experiences as women, both in the positive and the negative. Okay. Um, and it shows it's it shows really beautiful like similar themes of this so there's this group of girls that we're following and we see it goes between their mothers in the 90s as teenagers and them now as teenagers and kind of similar themes that their mothers were going through and now they're going through and how they handle them similarly or differently um and all sorts of things like this while they are being hunted by an a right okay and the reason, uh, obviously, I think that that as a concept is is kind of neat, right? There are a lot of things that we have seen in other forms of media lately, in other shows and movies. Um, you know, generational trauma, especially, has been a really powerful thing um, for both millennials and Gen Zers that we're unpacking and that we love to see in movies and TV. Um. But this show takes it a step further, and it takes that, I think, what is really foundational theme, and it uses the most creative camera angles and, like, shots and dialogue and, I mean, it just does so many things that are so absolutely creative. It shows, like, these really sadistic scenes in these young women's head of when they're getting pissed off about sexism and racism and like these men just being men around them and it shows them almost being villains but in their heads and it's like it does so many things to flip the female gaze not in terms of like the the things they think about the things that they talk about with their friends and the way that they approach this a character um and the showrunners do it from everything from I mean, I've given some examples of like content and whatnot and dialogue, but they, they I watched something that actually, the thing that made me watch the show was a behind the scenes clip that they showed before the show's release. 
which was the like a, just it was a few minutes about the making of Pretty Little Liars Original Sin. And what really got me hooked was the directors were talking about um, how Saints Row, the hit when they game. were sh- <laughs> what? <laughs> directors were talking about the hit game Saints Row from twenty twenty two. So the directors, when filming, were like, we're going to film the women from just below their eye line. Hmm. Right? Mm. So that the camera is just slightly looking up at the women. And when they're filming the men or when they film the A, they want to film it head on or looking down, which in traditional horror um, or in traditional horror movies, which, right. Which are, you know, what we would consider from the male gaze. It's flipped. Right. Because that camera angle is a position of power. Yeah. It It's showing you as the viewer how you view this subject. So we look down on women or we look them head on and we look up right. at the the characters of power. Right. And just that, like, small thing really does so much when you're watching it. I mean, it really it really changes so much. And um, I was doing a bit of research um, before our episode today, and I found this really interesting um, article about Jennifer's Body. Mm, yeah. The horror movie, Jennifer's Body. Um, and I, there's this quote from it that I found really interesting. Um, this is from Collider, and they say, um, Horror as a genre seems to have a harder time deviating from the female gaze, likely because so much of the suspense is built on deliberately objectifying subjects. We are often meant to delight in the violence as much as we fear it, and this causes us to distance ourselves from the subject in the frame and associate more with the monster devouring. But as time has gone on, more and more filmmakers have been able to create horror that utilizes the female gaze to great effect. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's it. That's why I'm. In, I wouldn't say I'm into horror, but I've been super into like thinking about where horror comes from, thinking about why we like horror. Um, and I've been really into horror from the female gaze lately because I've I've just been really interested in this. We've talked a lot about not just in terms of horror, but and in term we talk about it in terms of the MCU, and I think in terms of like shows and movies in general, we're there is like some sort of renaissance happening in the way that these mediums are being created um, that really feels revolutionary, um, not just for marginalized people, because I know that's what we're talking about right now when we talk about like women and, and POC being represented more, but like we're having more heartfelt stories and intense stories and stories that feel like something Right, right. More substance yeah. there, right? Because I mean, like the the big the big culprit when it comes to male gaze and stuff, uh, especially in horror, is the utilization of violence. What is considered violence from a male perspective, right? Like men perceive yeah, violence very, very deeply different than women perceive violence, right? Because women have an extra layer of how common sexual assault is. You know, like they, there's there's all sorts of different things that can bring that perspective where men just perceive horror or things that are scary as death and that's it right like a lot of times we have Mm -hmm. that we have the the creeping nuance of like having um you know a dark figure there you know like the typical ghost stories but women the female gays can talk about that from perspective of just simply being watched by somebody um and like perpetually watched by somebody and that's already an uncomfortable being in in, of of itself you know uh so it's it's good i feel like it's good that we have this conversation especially when it comes around the horror genre because as someone who loves the horror genre through and through like i i love horror content like i keep up with it as much as i possibly can um there is a lot of issues when it comes to horror and how it's been utilized uh to sort of pertain to what men deem as horrifying rather than the general consensus of who the broader spectrum of the audience could potentially be um mike has a a funny question here okay but what about vampire diaries is that male or female gaze (laughs) (laughs) dude i don't know i i would 
I would say it's it's a tough because va- vampires <laughs> are vampires are pretty <laughs> notoriously male gaze. Like, because, yeah. like, vampires are kind of just these creatures that just like to fuck and fight and, and eat things. And, like, but Vampire Diaries specifically has some stuff in it that is very, like, it it, it could be both. It could be a little bit of both. Like, <laughs> uh, Devin, what's up? Caroline's character? Oh, um, yeah, right. Devin, what's very... up? So, so I, I was just uh, looking into some things because, for me, the most recent movie that I thought actually portrayed, uh, you know, horror from the female gaze really well for me is barbarian uh specifically with the character tess in that movie she's like one of the main characters um it really kind of shows that side of horror that you know women have to deal with in in the real life especially in that first third of the movie because that that's the the anxiety that it builds in i was just reading through some facts about the movie Mm -hmm. um in the uh, in the movie, there's a Hollywood Reporter expose on AJ, uh, which is one of the main characters, and it is actually written by Kim Masters, who is a real life reporter at the Trade Publication, and she had a big hand in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein cases and became known for breaking the stories about men in the film and TV industry who have been accused of sexual assault. Right. So she had help in writing in this movie as well. Um, so this was this was a very focused. Um, they, they really wanted to make sure this viewpoint came from a realistic viewpoint of a female in situations like this, the, and the, not just some dude. The tough part about that, though, is I can't necessarily speak to that being true for the entire movie, and that and mm-hmm. that's why like I fought you a little bit the other day when you mentioned it because a, a large chunk of the movie is that like the entire first act of this movie which honestly in my opinion is the best part of this movie is the first act um Mm -hmm. they're they're yeah a hundred percent like i would absolutely stand by you and saying that like it is is pertaining to that because like the essence of that first act is you know a girl not wanting to stumble into potentially being assaulted by a man that she just met right uh but Mm -hmm. the rest of the movie crumbles that away and that and i think that's a big part of why i had so many problems with barbarian because it's like in one essence the thing that we were they were going for in the first act is so perfect and so well done and i wanted the rest of the movie to be that but when the plot twist happens everything falls apart because none of it makes any goddamn sense to me and i can't necessarily (laughs) say that i can defend it as a female gaze movie all in all because the antagonist definitely (laughs) <laughs> oh, I think that was the point. That was the point. Because, like, I another part is the script started out after uh, Krieger read Gavin D. Becker's book, The Gift of Fear, which encourages women to trust their intuition when confronted by obviously dangerous men. He used it as a writing exercise and being, began crafting a 30-minute short that consisted entirely of a conversation in which, a, in which a woman continues to ignore a mounting series of red flags. Hence, that beginning of the movie obviously i think that's what got adapted into that first act um but uh, okay okay i can i can yeah. i can see with that i can see with that and and i do see that that is still the main plot of the movie it just gets twisted into a very horror way um i mean is it you know, cuz the rest of the movies i i i think it's there i i personally i think it's I, I can't say anything or have yeah, that like, we can't, we can't conversation discuss it with too you. Deeply it, wait, we but it, it, it is people, there but... the whole time because honestly, that 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 plot is the reason why things are like that. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, I like guess yeah. barbarian. No, it it one hundred percent is. It's 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 so on I, it's, it's on, on HBO. HBO Max. You could watch it. Okay, I could. It's, got, it's we'll certified it. fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. It's got a ninety two. <laughs> Just saying. Or no likes Army of the Dead, but he doesn't like this movie. (laughs) Do you hate it, or no? Because that says a lot to me if you hate it. I I don't necessarily hate it. It, So here's here's my deal with Barbarian, okay? And I'm going to give you guys a rundown here. The first act of Barbarian is horror gold. It is fucking incredible. The entire first, like, 45 minutes of this movie is just absolute horror icon, iconry. Because it it is just so 
fucking well made and well written. You can feel the tension. The camera angles are fucking beautiful. The way they use like this sort of slow pan camera thing to make you feel a tension that is not actually present there. Uh, the, the story is incredible in the first act. There's a massive plot twist that happens that completely changes the foray of what we're looking at when it comes to this movie. And the movie becomes no longer what you thought it was about because it starts out as this one thing that's very like, oh shit, this girl could potentially be in some really wild shit here to this, I up, mean... to this upscaled situation of like, why is this fucking happening? And <laughs> Nothing that should have been explained, I felt like got explained. It just be it just it goes from like 40 to 180 in like the flip of a fucking switch. And that turned me off so fucking hard in this movie that like it it I can see why people like it because as a horror movie, it is just kind of ridiculous over the top fun when it comes to horror for the rest of the fucking time. Mm -hmm. But there was something in the first act that I wanted really, really badly, and they didn't capitalize on that. Because um, the first act feels like Last House on the Left. The rest of the movie mm. feels like The Hills Have Eyes. And mm. those two things don't connotate to me in one piece of subject. Uh, I I wouldn't... I I almost even make references to, like, The Descent even, too. Yeah, yeah, I could I could see a little bit of that, but yeah, but I I I think the plot escaped you for some reason, and I think you need to watch it again because that plot that you're talking about exists throughout the entire movie. I mean, especially without, I with AJ, I can't. Uh, here, here's especially the deal, especially with AJ. You can't say that though, because the based on the the main plot itself, yeah. I can't defend because I can't spoil it for anybody. But I it's know, not about but... that though. It's not about that at all. Like it's the rest of the plot is about something completely fucking different that doesn't get explained later on. Either yeah. way, we're not we're not here to to debate no. about fucking barbecue. This <laughs> I get... is all I want to say say <laughs> yeah. about this. I want to finalize this real quick. Think of that that thing that you're saying has nothing to do with the with the plot it totally does and think of it as an added piece like an added obstacle sure. so i think um <laughs> watch sure. it again dude something something or know that you're talking about um before this bit was this idea of what makes horror horror and the like you said something like of horror being horrifying and the uh, the acts being horrifying right mm -hmm. and so when we're thinking about generally horror from the female gaze i think something really interesting that you're poking on is like we're starting to question like what makes horror horrifying right um is it just the acts is it does it have to be acts against like certain people and um how can we like i think that something really fun about our generation as millennials is that like we're all really sad um <laughs> and True. like kind of nihilistic <laughs> yeah and True. so i think something that really that's fun that is happening in um kind of horror but like just general like shows and stuff is that we're starting to see more like things that are general it's like genuinely horrifying like life <laughs> you know <Sure. laughs> and not just this exaggerated like slasher -ness. um and so like something another another film recently that has been talked a lot about a lot oh dj do you have something well yeah so i, oh, I actually i, I want to give dj some space to kind of, kind of talk a little about yeah. this too. Oh. So D dj i mean ahead. like i i've been just absorbing because like i i personally i don't feel like i have a lot to say um, because, you know, I, I, I'm not big into the horror genre or like, you know, this is kind of like, I've always wanted to understand like how that, all that plays out, like the female gaze, the male gaze, you know, I, cause I never, never popped in my head before. I'm like, you know, now that it's like laid out for me, I'm like, oh, like that makes so much sense. <laughs> like, you know, uh, yeah. of how people frame things and, or like how, uh, movies frame things in in that perspective and like you know and it made sense to me because like that's what i thought you know what i mean that that's like that's what's in my head but then like seeing it from a different perspective makes it like oh shit like that's like now i'm terrified now like you know 
now I'm scared for these things too. <laughs> and I'm horrified about these aspects of life too. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to, it would be funny. Like, you know, maybe the next, uh, next movie is about like a landlord <laughs> asking <Yeah>. for more rent. <laughs> oh, maybe. And then, <laughs> Do you have rent? <laughs> you need to pay an extra 200. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, Alex, you about- forgot smoky lamp. <laughs> D- DJ, do you do you have any horror movies that you uh, that you feel like you do like that you feel are from the um, female ghost? I oh I don't because like I I don't think I've I've seen too much too many horror movies. Like I said, like when we were talking about like our reviews and like our favorite horror movies, but um, I I was thinking about this, and I don't know if it's exactly like the female gaze. I don't think it, it is, but I know that uh because I, i'm taking a japanese cinema class and we're talking about the movie Igetsu, and the director for Igetsu, um his themes like his kind of style has always been about like uh and it, and for people who, uh, at home who've never watched Igetsu, Igetsu is kind of like the first like that it's like the catalyst for j horror type of thing Sure. Like it's it's like what well, people people in Japan who make like J horror films like kind of reference, and it's kind of like that first kind of thing because like uh, after uh, some type of th- uh, uh, whole history behind that. But uh, the director, let me, I gotta I gotta look up the director's name. I'm sorry, when it gets you. It's okay. Um, who the fuck? Who the fuck? Uh, <laughs> oh, Mizuguchi, Kenji Mizuguchi, um. He writes or he does a lot of his films in the perspective of like he he touches on like women's like problems like in Japan. And at the time uh, in 1950, 1960, uh, this Western, the Westernization of Japan censors like uh, you couldn't directly talk about what's going on. So what the directors would do would they would put their their movie in like a period of time like way back like in the Edo period, right? Like we're with the samurais and all this stuff just to push this like kind of commentary on things currently happening. Uh, so Getsu is kind of like, uh, it's set in this ancient time and it's like a, a, a conglomeration of ghost stories put together into this one reform thing. Um, and there's a lot of themes in this film that touch on like, oh, how like, the typical like Japanese family gets destroyed by the man's pride to like that the stubborn pride to move forward and then like leaving the kind of the wife behind in this in this dangerous world where uh, their pride is blinding them from like the troubles that they're having at home um, where you know the the Japanese women have to take care of the kids and like do this and, and that like I, I thought it was I thought it was really cool seeing that you know i, I was because you feel for these characters for the these characters in, in this movie and you're like fuck that that fucker who just left his wife like that fuck that guy we want the worst for him yeah <laughs> fuck we that want dude. the worst for that yeah. guy yeah <laughs> hope you step yeah, on a like, he committed <laughs> adultery once like who's the real villain here it's him <laughs> and, <laughs> that fucker, yeah. so yeah. And, and since it's an old movie I'll, I'll spoil it so basically there's two there's two families right so one of them so the the main character basically the the husband he's out trying to sell his clay pots during this war time in some period in Japan and he gets contacted by this ghost lady. He doesn't know it's a ghost yet. It's like this noble lady who's been this ghost spirit that's been waiting hundreds of years to find a a like soulmate because she died without having a uh, finding one. And so and this she gets the the husband gets like coerced into this like marriage on accident and he's like he doesn't know that he's slowly like getting the life sucked out of him he's slowly dying from this um but then like he reveals to the the spirit like i've been unfaithful like i have a wife and i have a kid i lied to you and then like the spirit kind of like haunts him down whilst the wife is taking care of his son genjiro or uh yeah genjiro or something like that and she's like waiting for him to come home because he she thinks like oh he's out selling stuff he'll bring back money for us we'll build a house build a home and he, he can stop with all this like like pride filled like oh i could i can make it for us type of thing yeah. but then she dies because the 
the soldiers that are like conquering the lands are like taking over and then there's a, the other family the other wife gets like there's a, there's also like uh sexual assault and stuff like that because of that time and the way that that shot is framed it doesn't show it but it's like you can you it's can insinuated it right right which it's is the only time yeah. that you should be able to be able to do that right yeah so it was yeah. done in good taste so yeah like that type of thing it's it's that's a good comparison that's I... a good comparison yeah i just like as you're like describing everything all i can think of is like that's some horrifying shit yeah <laughs> like, it is it was right. it's it's shit sexual yeah. assault yeah like because like a commitment yeah. being haunted by his mistress like that was yeah. a ghost like that sounds horrifying and interesting <laughs> <laughs> good good choice dj good choice genesee yeah. i want to ask you as a sort of a final question to wrap things up here what are you wanting to see from movies with the female gays going forward um oof I think what I'm wanting to see is the, and not just in terms of the female gaze, but in terms of movies in general, what I really want to see is like stories being genuine and reflective of the voices that they're trying to capture. I think that's, that's really all I want in media, you know? And, um, I think in terms of the female gaze specifically, I we're seeing, I don't know. I think about Scream 5. I think about Don't Worry, Darling. Don't Worry, Darling was really trying to do something, and it didn't do it. Yeah. But I also really like that we're fucking up. You know, I like yeah. that we're, and I, I love that, like, Olivia Wilde was the director in that, right? And she's talked a lot about, and that's a great example of horror from the female gaze, like doing it and not doing it. Because I think in some ways they re they did capture a female gaze. And in some ways it was like, why was that the story that needed to be told? Because I don't think that it needed to be told. Like, what the hell? Yeah, um, sure. But also it was like, whoa, that's horrifying. Also, that's totally something that could happen. Like, not, yeah. not, but also, yeah. Right, right. And, um, and I, while some of these examples are kind of letdowns and like they're not exactly what we want to be seeing, and it's like, yeah, I think I could have lived without the plot of Don't Worry, Darling, living in my head rent free. I like that we're thinking about it, right? And I, I like that we're seeing it and we're entering more conversations. And I really hope that, like, in Olivia Wilde's case, because she is a, she is a woman who was involved in, like, she didn't write this script single-handedly, but she did decide the ending of this movie. She changed the script, like, she gave it to them, and then directed it, and we're like, honey, <laughs> what? Yeah. Like, this is the female story that you want to you wanna tell? And it's like, yes, the answer is yes. This is what she thought yeah, was, that, like, That's what it. she thought was doing it, it. yeah, right. Yeah. And so I want to see us... Um, I want to see us get it right. I want to see more examples of Pretty Little Liars. I want to see beautiful stories of women supporting women and um, of, like, the hard realities of being a person reflected in TV and film and how we overcome that together. But I also want to see conversations around things like Scream 5 and Don't Worry, Darling, where we're like, okay, why didn't this hit? And how can we, like, what what is it that we would have wanted to see? Um, right. I think they're both really equally important. All right. I like it, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking to us about it. And uh, DJ, thank you for being here for the learning experience. I'm sure that's greatly appreciated. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm always course, here to learn. Of course, baby. Yeah. So, guys, let's move into our schedule for next week. On Tuesday, we have the Good Kraken podcast. We're going to be talking, where is the Native American representation in gaming? So, uh, November is uh, Native American Heritage Month, and we're going to be kicking that off and having that conversation there to talk about why the fuck we don't see enough indigenous Americans in games uh, and what oh, we can do you, to get some more of it. That's going to be a fun episode there. Next Wednesday, we have another 7th Brevin, where our man Devin, the five slash man soon to be the five slight man again uh is going to be playing call of duty modern warfare 2 you guys gonna be coming in hanging out with him as he plays that and does the shoot shoot bang bang Devin, are you gonna be doing multiplayer 
Uh, yes, 100%. Shoot, shoot, bang, bang, <laughs> multiplayer. It's so like he tripped over himself. <laughs> I kind of did. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and then Thursday, we have another live shipwreck show recording. Uh, you guys already know what it is. You come in here, you join us as we talk about anything and everything that we could possibly ever want to talk about. If you're a Twitch subscriber, you can write in to the show in our Discord channel by going to the shipwreck I submissions did. tab that our Twitch subscribers have access to, and you can write in any question that you want us to potentially answer on the show we pick the best questions we think will make the best content and we answer them for you guys so come join us for that that's gonna be another fun one and then next friday we have splash damage where me and devin and garrick and dj are going to be playing chivalry 2 <laughs> yes hiya that's gonna be fucking chaos the oh. old blade across <laughs> his head <laughs> i'm so uh, excited for that you you mess. bet your you bet your ass. Man, your you, arms, gentlemen. I'm going to be talking like that the whole stream. That's fair. The whole time. I think that's fair. I think it's fair for us to assume that all of us are probably going to be that. Draw crazy. your blade, <laughs> young one. <laughs> <laughs> all that content for the first section of the week is going to be at 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Eastern time. But next Saturday, we have another good cracking podcast. We're going to be talking when was the golden age of film? Is it now? Is it before? Is it in the 1920s? We shall soon find 1990s out. 1990s piss filter. That'll be 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time right here at twitch.tv slash show. You guys can join us for that. Guys, please let us know some of your favorite female gays horror movies. Let us know what you guys want to see more of from the horror genre. Let us see how you want the male gaze and the female gaze to be a little bit more fucking balanced out here because that's what we actually need, right? We need more balance around here. Not at the GK yeah, show balance. though. We we don't have balance here. We uh, just have pure uh, unadulterated so chaos. Yeah, it's just it's just bullshittery. <laughs> Chaotic good. Chaotic but what's good. not bullshit is us because this has been the Good Cracking Podcast. Your choice for all the nerdy video game and pop media news, reviews, and discussions that you wanted to hear live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. and Saturdays at 12 p.m. right here at twitch.tv slash good crack and show if you're on this wave you can head on over to our discord channel where you can submit questions topics to show you can get exclusive content and you can soon have early access before episodes go live on podcast and video services across the digital sea Yerg. thank you sir you can also support us by going to our youtube channel by clicking that beautiful bell and big red button or by subscribing to our U excuse me <laughs> by subscribing to our podcast channel by searching good Kraken with an exclamation mark and leaving a review there we gotta get going on out of here everybody but until next time my friends i fucking hate barbarian <laughs> army of the dead sucks make room seasons here bye <laughs>